Are you ready to start adventuring further into the Australian wilderness but not sure where to start? In this video, we cover everything you need to know to ensure a successful and enjoyable journey into the great outdoors. From finding the perfect campsites with the help of must-have apps, to calculating fuel consumption and planning ahead for food and water supplies, we've got you covered. We also discuss what spare parts to bring along for emergencies and the essential equipment you'll need for a smooth off-grid experience. Well, good afternoon from Cambodia. So today what we're going to do before we get into any of the content um, from Cambodia is to cover off on sort of the Australian side of things. So before we did our channel update to announce that we were coming over here, we did put out um, a Q&A to everyone and there were some questions that came through. They must have came through while we were out filming it. So um, wanted to cover off on those as promised. Uh, before we get into the good stuff of exploring around the jungle. So I've got a few notes here to try and keep me on track. Um, pretty much going to cover off on how we do our trip planning. So how do we find sort of off-grid campsites, uh, places where there's not many other people, planning for fuel, food, water, spares, maintenance and that sort of thing. Pretty much what I do when I plan to go on a trip. Carly just says, hey, we're going to go here. And I'm like, all right, no worries, let's go. <laughs> I was originally just going to do this by myself because I do most of the planning and uh, a lot of the time our planning is like there is a large element of winging it but I'll have at least done a little bit of research in the lead up to allow us to comfortably wing it. Cool. All right. So the main resources that we use for our trip planning is Google, Wikicamps, HEMA, and to a lesser extent, all trails. Um, so those are, the, those are the key ones. For planning things off the beaten track, a lot of the time what we will do is both of us will just like scour Google satellite. <laughs> <laughs> look, look for cool satellite image formations on the ground and then pick a spot and then search from there outwards. Yeah, just zoom in, zoom in, that looks cool, that looks different. I think there's sort of a bit of a perception that the Australian outback is all just flat, barren desert, and uh, it definitely is not that. So yeah, we just spend a lot of time <laughs> scrolling on Google Satellite and um, seeing, seeing what looks good. So a good example of that was how we found out about the Helena Aurora Ranges. And if you're from WA, you're probably thinking, how did you not know about the Helena Aurora Ranges? Everyone knows about that, but neither of us knew about it. And so, yeah, I was just just scrolling through Google. I sort of started around Payne's Find. I think Ronnie Dahl was at Payne's Find, and I was like, oh, what's at Payne's Find? And then just sort of zoomed in and, and kept zooming in, and I was like, oh, there's a nature reserve here. Wow, it looks like there's um, a mountain range here. But, yeah, it just sort of went from there. And so then once, um, for me, I don't really know what Paul does. He probably just looks at it and thinks that's cool. Um, but for me, what I'll then do is open up, wiki camps and um, you know type in Helena Aurora ranges and then have a look on wiki camps and see if there's any free camps around get to wiki camps in a minute but honestly a lot of a lot of what we do is just scaring particularly um, if we're going out to look at salt lakes um, the satellite view is a great way to see what salt lakes are around that might be interesting um, locations for us to put the drone up and we might be able to camp around there or that sort of thing. The other thing that we use Google for a lot, obviously, is for navigation. Um, so when we're um, actually sort of out bush navigating, we tend to use a combination of Google and HEMA. Yeah, so we use the HEMA, we use Google to get somewhere and then the HEMA we use to track to get to where we go the whole time so we can get out. And we also, there's tracks that are, are on HEMA that aren't on Google and vice versa <laughs> and sometimes there's tracks on both of them which don't exist so this yeah. is true um so like a really good example of using the the combination of the two was um we were when we went to millstream to just up and we really wanted to get to george gorge um that was like one of the main reasons that we went up there and um 
the main road was closed, so we we're looking at alternative routes and Google sort of had some tracks that went towards it, but not the whole way. And then HEMA had tracks that sort of met up with that. And so between the two um, resources, we were able to sort of work out, okay, like we should be able to get through um, another track to where we wanted to go and managed to make it while the, the main road in was still closed. So. So once we have found somewhere that looks pretty interesting, um, I'll just drop a, a drop pin. Um, so as you can see from my screen here, I've got drop pins, um, particularly all over WA, but all over Australia as well. And so that's just a little trigger for me to think there's something cool there. Maybe sometimes um, we'll be going past the area and I'll bring up my Google, have a look at the drop pins and be like, oh yeah, what's this one? But yeah, it's a, it's a way of keeping track of um, places that look interesting so that um, if we are trying to think of somewhere that we can go, depending on how much time we've got, then you know, I can have a look at those drop pins um, or if we're passing, passing through. Final point on Google is that um, obviously a lot of what we do is outside of um, phone range. And so if you... Uh, do have a pretty good idea that you're going to be out of phone range. If you're going somewhere more remote, you can actually uh, download offline maps. Uh, if you click on your account uh, information, select offline maps, then select your own map, and um, it will allow you to select um, an area to download, and that'll download all the data. So even if you do um, go outside of phone range, um, you know that provided that where your destination is, is also um, in a downloaded area, you can still safely navigate your way out of there. Um, the, only, the only thing you don't get is satellite imaging. So you just get the standard map view, but you get all the roads, points of interest, all the, everything you need. Yeah. So next resource that we use a lot um, before and during trips is good old wiki camps. Uh, most of you, if you've done any traveling before, you'd be aware it's a app, one-off, eight, nine dollar payment. I think it might have changed recently. Um, but that's it. You don't pay any ongoing fees and it is like the best travel Bible that you could hope for. So crowdsourced one, so people put a spot on there and other people review it, so it's completely crowdsourced. So it's, it's actually people go to these spots and they put them out and... You can find some banging spots. Yeah. Now, how you use wiki camps will largely depend on how you like to camp and travel. Um, for us, we like to do mostly free camping. So uh, we'll turn off caravan parks, we'll turn off backpacker hostels, we'll leave on day use areas and points of interest, um, info centres. We don't need to worry about dump points. Water facility is really good one to have. Um, and then we'll select free camps. Um, now you can just toggle the, the settings depending on uh, what you want to do. Um, you know, if you're traveling with dogs, you might want to select dogs allowed, that sort of thing. Um, so you can set it up completely for um, what suits you and your setup. So you, you know, if you've got a, a camper trailer and you want to make sure that you're going to be able to get in there and you're not going to get stuck, then you can select camper trailer accessible, that sort of thing. Even there's Telstra reception. There's reception on. Yep. So you can check that if you if you want to contact people, you know that you can get reception at certain points. Yeah, heaps and heaps of filters um, so that you can um, sort of tailor it for exactly what you want to do and where you want to go. Then once that's done, you hit apply and um, just zoom in and see what's out there. So um, for the overwhelming majority of the campgrounds that we stay at. Uh, we will use wiki camps to find free camps. And as Paul sort of mentioned when we did our trip uh, down south last year, even if um, you find a free camp and you go there and it's packed or whatever, um, if you're in an area where there are a lot of free camps, it's a pretty good indication that free camping is allowed. So um, that for us, you know, because we've got a setup where we can just take sort of random tracks and go exploring and don't really need to worry about getting stuck too much, we'll just go for a look around and um, see if we can find any campsites in that area that aren't necessarily on Wikicamps or Google or Heme or anything like that. Um, so the other really good thing about Wikicamps is that you can download it for offline use. So um, we try and mostly use things that are optimised to be able to use um, both when we do have reception and when we don't. So 
uh, with Wikicam, so you can download um, one state at a time, depending on where you're traveling, and that will have all of the information. Um, it will have, usually have your reviews, uh, but not photos. So there's, you know, you do lose a little bit of the functionality of what you would have if you were online, but all the basics, um, locating camps um, and being able to see what facilities they've got, that's all available when you download them for offline use as well. So yeah, I currently have a HX1, um, which I was using on the old cloud, and he has brought out the new cloud, which the HX1 won't load to, so you have to get a new style of HEMA to be able to, it, able to do it, but you can link your tracks between the two clouds, but it's a pain in the ass because... Yeah, and it's like some of them, some of them aren't loading. No, that's because my password for my old HEMA cloud is not working on the new HEMA cloud, <laughs> even though I changed it and I checked it and changed it and I asked them and... So, yeah. Yeah. So, it is, um, it is a, a good resource. Again, there's some tracks which will be on here, which won't necessarily be on Google. It's a great way of tracking where you've been. Um, so you can see from our sort of snapshot of WA, it's got a lot of our tracks here. There's, there's a hell of a lot missing, mm -hmm. uh, which is a bit annoying, sort of all the ones from down uh, when we did the old tele track, they're not loading for whatever reason. Um, but again, it's another, um, it's another sort of bit of kit in order to help make sure that you don't get lost. It's completely standalone. Um, and then we do also have the uh, HEMA4 Drive Atlas as a, if all else fails, if all technology, Chernobyls, everything somehow runs flat, um, then we've got our little um, full Drive Atlas mm -hmm. as well. And some of the, um, some of the little fold out maps I quite like as well. The one good thing about the HEMA is if you do forget to do, download your offline Google Maps, you can still track yourself and work out where you need to go and how to get places if you don't have that ability. Let me just check my notes to make sure I'm not going too off track. Oh yeah, um, final, final resource. So we've looked on Google or whatever, we've seen something on social media, it's like that place looks really cool, we wanna go there, we've sussed out on wiki camps and HEMA, you know, how to get there, where we can stay. Um, I'll generally then have a bit of a look on All Trails, um, which is another app. The majority of the features are free, so you can um, anyone can sort of open it up and have a look at what walking trails are around and that sort of thing. If we're, I'll have a scope sort of around where we're camping to see if there's any walking trails that we can do that look interesting to sort of break up the drives and for a little bit of fitness for us, which is sometimes lacking on the road and too many beers. Too many of fitting these beers in our mouths. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm just zooming in on a, on a random spot here. I'll tell you Kalari track, uh, 2Ks, whatever. This is out around Hyden Way. And I do have a premium subscription for this because with the premium subscription, you can again download the, the maps so that if you do go out for a walk, you've got reception when you leave and then you lose it halfway through and then you get lost or whatever else, um, you know um, you can still use that to sort of navigate yourself safely back to um, your car or wherever you started from. Um, so yeah, that's another app that we use in order to help try and find some interesting places um, where we're traveling. One of the other points that was sort of touched on with our Q&A was suppose the ethics of naming places that we visit. Um, our sort of take on it is that if uh, a location, a campsite um, is on either Google, Wikicamps or HEMA, it's not a secret spot. It's already out there. Anyone can look at it. Um, and so we'll name those places. But if we find a spot that isn't on any of those um, apps, maps, resources, whatever, then uh, we won't name it, but generally you'll have a few crumbs left um, because you'll know where we're coming from, where we're going to, um, uh, for you to go and try and find it for yourself. I gotta leave some fun. <laughs> Can't give you all the answers. <laughs> gotta have some mystery in it. Absolutely. 
Otherwise, I mean, we've got a small following. It's not like we're going to go somewhere and then suddenly there's going to be thousands of people converging on a beautiful spot. But, um, you know, we don't want these places that are maybe locals, um, camp spots or whatever, getting, getting overrun. So that's our take on it. Um, let us know what your thoughts are. There are some people that don't name any of the spots they go, even though they're super iconic and it's really obvious where they are. Um, and some people name absolutely everything. For us, I, we sort of think that's the happy medium. Moving on to fuel consumption and planning. So on the last trip, I um, sort of jotted down in my little notes app um, what my consumption was most of the times that I filled up. Not every single time. I, my memory is not that good. But I found that fully laden, and I would have been up pretty close to GVM, I would averaged 13.5 litres per 100 case, which was... Mostly highway driving, but um, yeah, obviously a little bit of everything. So uh, I was pretty happy with that. Yeah, that's not that's not too bad. What did you find that you had? So my last the last trip, I didn't actually worry about it. I'd rather be out loud and cruise. <laughs> <laughs> I've given up on worrying about it. But I haven't changed too much on the rig um, since last time. I did full check on it, and it's normally around town. Not fully loaded, but everything stays in the car. It's about 18 litres per 100. On the highway, it's about similar um, headwind. Sometimes it goes up to like 20, 21, but pretty much that's the way it is all the time, no matter what. So, Yeah. So that's sort of the, the touring consumption that we generally look at. For me around town, I'll use about 10.5 per 100 on average, like commuting to and from work, max like 80 k's an hour, so pretty economical really. And then I find that my consumption is like absolutely exorbitant through the roof, um, sand driving or any kind of slow, um, rocky tracks. So uh, a really good example of that was the old telly track um, that we did last year. I was up around the 20 litres per 100 mark. So as a general rule, if we're, um, if we're going to go away somewhere and we know that we're going to be doing beach driving, soft sand, and or um, really slow, windy, rocky, crappy track. I'm, so, I'm like PTSD thinking about the for days. Literally, there's no straight bits of road on this whole track. It's literally this the whole way. Um, yeah, I'll factor about double of what my usual daily consumption is um, to then work out whether I need to take a jerry. Um, I do have a 140 litre long range tank, so fuel is probably less of a concern to me than it is to Paul, but it does absolutely chew through it on the soft stuff. Mm. It does, it's strange. The cruiser doesn't change that much in comparison to how much the Hilux changes. Yeah. So, yeah. like that trip we did down Margaret River where we used the same amount of fuel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, I I got like three, this is my, my old tank, it was 73 litres. I only got 300 k's out of it. I almost ran out of fuel pulling into that up. <laughs> and my gauge wasn't reading accurately either, so I thought I still had about an eighth of a tank left and then it took 71 litres. <laughs> yeah, it was exciting. That was strange when we both filled up and then we put an identical amount of letters in and I was like, ooh. Yeah, not not ideal. It's a good thing out the V8. It just, it just sits on the 18 to 20 letters all the time. Is it good? Yeah, at least I know it does. <laughs> um, and so then in terms of planning, uh, as a general rule, you'll have a pretty good idea of where the major towns are, um, you know, along the way. Um, say when we went out to Steep Point, we knew that Overlander was going to be our last fuel stop, so we worked out um, how far it was from Overlander to Steep Point and then uh, from one end of Durkar, Togg Island to the other and then back. And um, we 
we sort of worked out that you might need an extra 20 litres um, based on that distance and based on a really conservative guess of how much fuel he would use. So yeah, we blow it out a bit just to yeah. be safe. Always add a little bit of extra fat on because it's better to have it and not use it than to need it and not have it. It would take 40 litres or just 20? 40 litres, yeah. We took 40. Took 40. Yeah. Didn't need it, but we had it. Yeah. And then when I didn't think I would need it down when we did the Esperance to Yukla, I didn't think I would need it, but I needed it. <laughs> yeah. But I took 60 litres extra then. Yeah. Because we're so far off grid for so long. Yeah. That was, I think you used about 40 of that, didn't you? Yeah. Mm. So, yeah. I know, obviously, weight is a consideration when you're looking at how much extra fuel to bring. Um and yeah, if you've got to make some sacrifices with some other stuff that you don't really need to get a little bit of extra fuel in, even if you don't really think you'll need it, would definitely recommend that you prioritise the fuel and, and things that are sort of going to get you out of trouble. Yeah, so if you're not sure what fuel stations are around, we do also use um, Fuel Map, uh, which is another app, and that will tell you where all your service stations are, what type of fuel they have. So if you need premium diesel it'll tell you if it's got premium diesel or if it's just got truck diesel um, and it also give you um, pretty much real-time pricing so um, that is also crowdfunded so true. if people don't update the price of the fuel it will tell you like last updated two weeks ago last updated this morning of the fuel price you can kind of know what the fuel price is at yep. the time or when it was last updated yeah obviously the most important thing is knowing that you can get to where you're going um, and then to another fuel station without running out of fuel. But if um, if you do have uh, enough fat, then you can compare prices. Um, if it's only 20 k's up the road and you can save 20 cents a litre, um, that's another good app for you to use. Another, another quick tip with fuel is carry some cash. Mm. So we, we always carry enough cash to fill up two, two fuel tanks in the car, so car leaves empty, I'm empty. You get broken into now. We carry cash, <laughs> yeah, mate, but. So if you get to a fuel station, they got no ATMs or they got no FPOS and you can't pay for fuel, you might be sitting there a while. My, which my brother experienced once, come back down from Exmouth Overlander, mm. it was banged up and he had cash, he was able to fill his car up and continue to keep going down south. Coming home, and I think it's happened a few times, and even if you go to stations, if you run out of fuel, you've got cash, you can buy fuel from stations sometimes if you need it. Yeah, power way. outages, internet outages, um, any of that stuff is going to stop the FPOS machines working. So cash is king. Yeah, we, we don't actually carry that much, but that's what you guys should do. It's not really that much money, really, two fuel tanks. It's only about two and a half grand. <laughs> <laughs> All right, water. Uh, water. So every, see, everyone's consumption is going to be a little bit different. It's going to depend massively on uh, what your setup is. Us by ourselves, no. Well, we do have a shower, but we don't use it very often. Um, you know, not having to worry about sinks and showers and whatever else like a caravan does. We go through about six liters a day, I reckon. Um, between the two of us, so two litres each for drinking water, one litre for coffees, and then one litre for washing up water. Um, so we're pretty conservative um, with water, and we can carry up to 140 litres, which is um, that's a pretty long time off grid. Yeah. <laughs> for us. For us. Especially when you do away with the washing up because you're stuck somewhere. So yeah, my, my suggestion with planning how much water you'll need is just work out what your average daily consumption is and then um, based on what your capacity is, you can work out how long you can go between um, filling up with water. Wiki camps, again, wiki camps is king. Wiki camps will tell you where the water points are if you've got that um, on, on your filters. Um, other, so I mean, most servos will have water where you can fill up. You might have to pay a little bit for it, I think. On average, 
Um, the road houses that we've stopped at, the going rate's about $2 per 10 litres. Obviously, caravan parks and tourist information centres will be able to point you in the right direction um, for where you can find water if you need it. We will take, generally, when we go away, a minimum of 100 litres uh, because, it's again, it's better to have too much and not use it. So Paul's got a 55-litre um, tank in his canopy. I've got a 50-litre tank in my canopy. And I've also got a 40-litre footwell water tank. Um, so pretty much the whole last trip that we did, um, we weren't going off grid for particularly long periods of time. Um, so I left my footwell tank empty just to kind of try and keep that weight down because I knew that I was up around that 2,800 mark, which is up getting um, towards my GVM. So, um, but again, if we were going super remote, I'd probably just fill that tank up. Well, like we did at Dirhato, we took the extra 20 litre jerry can of water. Mm -hmm. So if we did run out of all of our tank water, we know we have 20 litres of water left. Yeah. And that's purely drinking. Like, oh shit, we're in trouble. We've only got water. We've got 20 litres of water left. One thing we are going to do when we get back to Australia so that we don't have to worry about that is put indicator, get electronic indicators. Level sensors? Level sensors um, for the water tanks because at the moment it's real guesswork. And yeah, just sort of based on six, maybe eight litres a day at most. Uh, we know that we'll usually go eight, nine days with both tanks full before we start to um, get concerned. But yeah, anyway, that's enough about water. I have much to say about food, except just take heaps of it. <laughs> We, we always take heaps of tinned food, heaps of rice, heaps of pasta, um, stuff that's not going to go bad, stuff that um, if you do get yourself into a situation and you're stuck and you, for whatever reason, don't have a PLB, um, if you've got plenty of food and plenty of water, then you're going to be all right. Like someone's, someone's going to come along, someone's going to find you. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're stuck to a large extent. Um, Plenty of tin food. Try not to take glass. Yeah, glass is bad. Glass is bad. Yeah. Baked beans. Live off baked beans. Tin spaghetti. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's food. Well, you know, on the foods that we've we've both got the upright fridges now, so we do take quite a few fresh veggies, and we've both got the little freezers. And you've got the freezer in the front. Yeah. Yeah. We. So. You know, we have because we like to go away for you know, sometimes 10 days at a time off grid, we do take a lot of food and we do have um, uh, my little 12 litre Bushman's is converted to a freezer pretty much full time. And then we've got the, um, the little freezers in the upright fridges as well. Um, full of hash browns. <laughs> hash browns and ice cream. Ice cream. <laughs> Health. Health. Um, but that's, that's probably not... You know, my, uh, I suppose I don't want to. I don't want to sound like we're talking people down the garden path where, like, you have to have all this stuff um, to go off grid. Um, but yes, we do. We do take a lot of food and a lot of frozen stuff because, again, you know, you get yourself one. It, it extends our endurance um, off grid, and then also it just is that little bit of extra redundancy if we do get stuck. And we end up making scurvy meals with our fresh veggies because it's, oh, like, yeah, it's like been a nuclear trip. It's, <laughs> it's been a while since um, I've brought out an episode of Grim Camp Kitchen. G'day and welcome to tonight's episode of Grim Camp Kitchen. <laughs> Just remember that anywhere along the level you cannot buy anything fresh anywhere. <laughs> All right, spares. I might take you down a little trip down memory lane. When I first realised that I had a crack in the intercooler, I did actually run through all the spares um, that I was carrying at the time. Uh, so always bring some spare oil, uh, spare premix coolant, a uh, spare drive belt, 
some injector cleaner, uh, spare fuel filter, WD-40, not really a spare, just a necessity. Uh, down the toolbox is here, spare alternator. I've learnt my lesson from not travelling with one of those previously. Power steering fluid. Brake fluid. Uh, in the trunnel drawer, I've got all the tools and uh, spare CV and also some spare radiator hoses. And in here, spare air filter, CV boot, wheel bearings. Um, that's pretty much it. So along the lines of spares, we think about what is going to immobilize our vehicles from progressing forward. And they're the spares that we bring as one of the spares. And then we wean down down the, down the chain from that to stuff that's nice to have, if you've got room, the weight. And then some things that you might not never use, but the weight of it's nothing, so you can throw it in because it's nice to have. So big shout out to Ronnie Dahl because he has all the 70 series and he does a really good video on 70 series parts. So that's where I get all my tips. <laughs> if you don't drive a 70 series, then that video is most not good for you, but well, it might be good for you because it actually shows you a lot of things for, for a lot of vehicles. But yeah, things like um, radiator hoses, 79 series alternator, um, wheel studs and nuts, which if I didn't have those spares, I'd be stuck in between Perth and Hyden somewhere because I snapped them. And then obviously, yep, for me as um, an IF, IFS scum. Yeah. Um, Solid axle load. A spare CV and CV boot. And then also, so we've both got full toolkits um, with uh, socket sets, drills, all your basic sort of spanners, screwdrivers, and that sort of thing. And I have on a number of occasions thought, oh, why do we need to take two? Like it's just more weight. It's probably like, I don't know, 30 kilos worth of tools and stuff that I carry as well. And he's a tradie. He's got way better stuff. But for those of you who've been watching for a while, you'll know that we do go day tripping in the Lux. Mm. And um, so I keep that in there so that if we do do a day trip, we're not um, – because there's no way that we're going to remember to put his tools in my car to go and do a day trip. If we do get into trouble, I do still have tools that um, can get us out of trouble. Yeah. I go a little bit above and beyond with my tools. I take my full work tool bag, which is not – it's not massive. It's like a backpack. It's got all my soldering iron, crimpers, Really pliers, all that general stuff. Grinder. Then I take a socket set, a big, not a big socket set, which goes up to like, I don't know what size it goes up to, it's huge. And then I bring all my battery tools. So I bring a drill, a impact wrench, and I bring a impact gun, and I bring a grinder. And I've used that grinder a lot. Yeah. It is very handy. As a, as a bare minimum, just a basic toolkit. A massive shifter because there's some big bolts on cars that come loose, which you don't realise. And I had to buy this huge <laughs> shifter just to do my one bolt up on my steering. Yeah. Stay on it now. Yes. If you do go want to go <laughs> above and beyond, um, yeah, he's he's got everything, and he has and he has used it. To be fair, um, it just depends on again what sort of driving you're doing, how realistic it is that you're going to need to be. Um, fabricating plates to fix your trailer and the yeah to to re-bolt my axle underneath yeah, my trailer onto it in the of middle thing. of the great central highway yeah yeah um so yeah again you don't you don't need all the fruit it's a nice to have but as a bare minimum i would say like i've just got a crappy um king's toolkit and a ozito um uh power drill so I don't have all the fruit, but it's enough for me to be confident that nine times out of ten, if we run into any problems, I've got the tools to get us out of it. And a big mention goes to my nut and bolt kit. <laughs> I think every single trip, 
I use something out of my nut and bolt kit. I've got nuts, bolts, screws, little bits of cable, I've got fuses, I've got connectors, I've got heaps of just random stuff in there. But pretty much if I do a job on one of our cars and it requires me to remove a standard bolt and then you put the aftermarket bolt in for whatever you're bolting, those bolts go into this container and they stay in my ute. And I've Plus I've got an array of five, six, eight, ten, and 12 mil nuts and bolts in there, tech screws, and they get used a lot. It's Mainly true. on the Hilux, but they get used a lot. Oh, calm down. <laughs> Occasionally. <laughs> So yeah, another question was on about our daily maintenance. Ah, we're tired. We don't have to worry about that. <laughs> that is not true. That is why. <laughs> no, it's pretty much a general just going over. Um, pop the bonnet, check your air filter, check your oil levels, check your radiator for coolant, check your intercoolers for cracks. Every day, kids, every day. Um, yeah, just checking for any moisture that wasn't there the day before, climbing under the car, having a quick check for nuts and bolts, drive chain. Um, I check my wheel bearings fairly regularly because on the cruises, the front ones come loose, which on the last trip I had to tighten them up front once each side. Wheel studs, that's another thing we check over pretty regularly if we're going corrugated roads and whatnot, if we've had our tyres rotated recently or you've taken them off. Double check them. Yeah, and just a general check over you'll you can see when things are coming loose or if something's leaking. Mm. And not your car. I know my car pretty well. I know what comes loose. I know what has issues, things I have to check. And I've checked online. I've watched different people's videos on what they do with their cars and their maintenance of the same type of car. And they normally point out certain things and you see things that fail on, on YouTube videos and that regularly on a certain car, like, wheel studs and certain things and CVs, people doing CVs and that. So yeah. they're the things that you can build up a, your own repertoire and your, of what you need to look at. Um, all right, the last thing we're going to cover off on is emergency equipment. One of the most important parts. It is. It is one of the most important parts. I'm the first to admit that I was a bit of an idiot when I not when I first started four driving, but in the years before I met you. Yeah, we, we're, all, we're all there. We've all been there. <laughs> I, did some, I did some really long haul um, off grid trips like the Savannah Way from uh, Catherine to Cairns in the wet season with a cyclone a day behind me with no PLB, uh, no recovery gear, not even a shovel. And I made it, but do not do that. What you should have as an absolute minimum <laughs> is a PLB. Um, if, so if you're going off grid, yeah. If, if yes, no reception. Even if you're in reception, to be honest. Yeah, uh, I would think it less likely, but if your phone goes flat. If your phone goes flat, but also, you know, you might think that you're going somewhere that should have reception and then it doesn't. Um, again, there's apps that will tell you where you can get um, reception, 3G, 4G, 5G, um, but it's not an exact science. Well, if you buy one, just carry it all the time. Yeah. We do. Yeah. Do we, have, do we bring it over here? It won't work here. Oh. It's only registered for Australia. Mm. PLB, we just use the, um, the GME. Uh, one, I'll, I'll put the picture of it on the screen. Uh, but some, some means of communicating with the outside world. That's probably the most cost effective one. Um, you can get satellite phones, that sort of thing. Some of the plans are super expensive, but um, you know, for us, we just want to be able to tell someone that both vehicles have got catastrophically bogged in the middle of nowhere and please come get us. Pretty much. Yeah. Or well, someone's been bitten by a snake or something's really urgent. Someone's been bitten by a bee. Um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that's what we've got that for. Recovery gear. Um, absolute bare minimum, a shovel. Like a shovel and time will get you out of most places. 
not everywhere, but 95% of the time, I reckon. Um, next up, I would say some recovery tracks. And then if you're going to be traveling regularly, you want to have a winch. Oh, yeah. They're handy. They're, they're a handy bit of equipment. Just, they're just a tool to move stuff off the track, to recover, to recover other people. Yeah. And again, you know, if you're just sort of a, a weekend warrior and not doing anything crazy and you're, but you're more concerned about weight, yeah, maybe, maybe don't worry about the, the winch, but, you know, make sure you have at the very least got a shovel and some max tracks and, yep, yeah, that... You can't say max tracks, we're not, we're not sponsored by them. Uh, some recovery, <laughs> some recovery tracks, sorry. <laughs> max tracks, call us. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, first aid kit and a snake bite kit. Pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you want to be able to render first aid if there is an accident, um, either to yourself or you come across someone out in the bush, likewise, snake bite kit. Um, so yeah, the brand that we use for um, both the first aid kit and the snake bite kit is survival first aid kits, but there's heaps of different brands out there. Yes, By no means is any of this um, an endorsement. I'm pretty sure you can even buy them from um, Kings. Yeah, the survival ones like you can get them everywhere. St John's, I got a St John's first aid kit in my car. You can go on St John's and you can you can pick the level that you want. You can go for full trauma kits or you can get a basic first aid kit. And I do recommend also if you are going to do this stuff, then also get yourself on a first aid course as well and know how to use the the kit that you bought. That's a very good point. And first aid kits don't come with like Panadol and Nurofen and that, so we always stock up those things in the bags and EpiPens and things that we need. But yeah, it's also yep. a good thing to have because you can have a little bit of an injury or maybe a self-induced injury and you might need a couple of Panadol in the morning. Do you have a story to tell, dear? No. I do. <laughs> was that Easter? No, it wasn't Easter. It was, um, it was, it was October. It was about two months after we started dating. We went camping up at Wilbinga and Paul decided to do a standing backflip on the sand dunes, but he didn't land it and he landed it on his head. We'd had six beers, so neither of us could drive and we had no Panadol or Nurofen and it yeah. turns out his neck was broken. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's fine. That's what, um, that's what rum's for. <laughs> So always good to carry some of the basics with you as well. Now, snappy Cambodia update. I didn't want to put it at the start because some people might just want to watch the planning side of things and not care about who we are and the fact that we're in Cambodia. So we got here about a month ago now. Um, we have filmed our first episode on our little motorbike, um, which will be out in a couple of weeks. And this morning we went and put down a deposit on a car which is super exciting. Yeah, that's super cool. Um, so yeah, it's taken a little while, just a little bit of context. So when you're sort of moving to Cambodia, you can't get like a two year visa before you fly in. You have to fly in and then get your long-term visa, uh, which takes about three weeks. And then until you've got that visa, you can't get a driver's license, a bank account. Um, we haven't been able to get any of our stuff shipped over, so um, we're just living off what was in our bags when we flew in a month ago. Um, so it's all happening now. We've got the visa, we've got our driver's licenses, we're getting a bank account um, sorted this week so we can then pay for and pick up the new vehicle. So exciting. <laughs> and then hopefully um, this week we'll also get um, all of our stuff. So we did bring a little bit of camping stuff over, real basic stuff. Um, and then we'll be able to get back out there and start properly exploring. Definitely. Yeah. And if you so, made this far in the video, please put a comment down of what you want to see us doing over here. Yes, I did put a poll up. Uh, we've got a few responses so far. At the moment, a little bit of everything is, is winning. Um, what you want to see from us over here. Vote for Jungle Basham, Jungle Basham. <laughs> I want to see. We've we got like nearly 900 subscribers, so I think we can probably get um, a few more votes on that one. Um, so let us know. Jungle Basham, 
because Cambodia doesn't recognise uh, international driver's licence, if you come here, you're probably not going to be able to go jungle bashing. So do you want to see stuff that you can do if you come here? Do you want to see temples? Do you want to see waterfalls? Do you want to see island hopping? Do you want to see overnight hikes? Um, let us know. We're probably going to do all of it anyway, um, but we won't necessarily film it if um, no one wants to watch it. So, well, we will. Stuff is you can have to watch anyway. <laughs> Thanks again for watching, guys. Hopefully, you've enjoyed. This is the last of the content that we'll be covering from Australia. So, if you are keen to watch some gnarly uh, Southeast Asian four driving, make sure you hit that subscribe and like button because that's what's coming up for the next two years. We'll see you on the next one. <laughs>